I represent a company in, in uh, Cape Town called Tel South Africa. We've been around for a little over 50 years, started as a South African company in the 60s and were acquired by a British company in, I think it was the early 2000s. Um, our holding company, the British company is Norcross PLC. They own Tel, Tile Africa, Johnson Tiles and the House of Plumbing in Joburg. So we've got quite a big footprint and we are largely manufacturers and suppliers of various products in the building industry. Okay, so we've got a layered approach here. <clears throat> this is the TEL multi-level flooring system. We call it a multi-level flooring system because it isn't just one product. There's several products that make up your leveling system. These include primers, a primer, a broadcast medium, uh, a moisture barrier, a self-leveler, and of course an adhesive when you're bonding uh, vinyl flooring down. A lot of this presentation is going to is going to speak to vinyl as the final floor finish because that's the trend. Um, that's what a lot of us are selling every day or, or assisting with every day. Um, there's a massive upswing in the sales of LVT, luxury vinyl tile, in residential um, developments, also commercial developments. And uh, the preparation of the flooring will really speak to various other systems that are applied laterally to that as well, like your epoxy flooring systems, for example, or your epoxy or polyurethane screeds. So in terms of surface preparation, okay, it's always important to understand the surface onto which you're going to apply a finish. So when I go to site, and I normally, I normally speak to, to delegates, well, I speak to delegates quite regularly, and a lot of contractors don't have the right equipment and you don't have to spend an absolute fortune to test floors. You just need some basic equipment that can give you an idea of what you're dealing with. So I always start with my chipping hammer, a very simple and inexpensive tool. It's quite weighty. It's got a nice, well, it used to have a nice sharp edge at the back. You can see I've used it for many years and it's quite blunt now. But what the chipping hammer does, it allows me to understand um, if, or learn if there's any hollow areas on the floor. So you can, you can drag this across the surface of your floor. And um, if you understand what you're listening to, uh, you can, you'll be able to identify where problematic areas of that floor could be if there are. So typically, if I hear scratchiness on the surface, and we're dealing with a screed going on top of a concrete surface bed or suspended slab, that scratchiness normally indicates that your topping is debonding from your concrete base. Okay, if you're hearing hollows, that could mean the same sort of thing. Depending where the hollow is, if the hollow could be further down, it could be subsidence of soil or, or a different kind of delamination. It just depends, you know, but it, it really gives you an opportunity to understand what you're dealing with and what you need to do to rectify the problems. So that's an inexpensive tool. Another inexpensive tool is a reverberating rod. This I got gifted when I joined Tel. This is a very nice uh, instrument. So it's, it's a stainless steel rod with the weight on the end. And this does pretty much the same as what the hammer does. Uh, except you don't have to go down on your hands and knees. So if you're larger like me, this is much better. So this is the same, the same thing as your, as your chipping hammer. You drag it over the surface. It'll allow you to hear if there's any hollows or if there's any scratchiness, and it allows you to look further down. Okay. Uh, should I pass this around so you guys can have a look, feel it? You know, often guys use broom, broomsticks or, or rebar, but it could assist in helping you, you know, identify certain things, but a weighted, a weighted ball at the end actually makes, makes a hell of a difference in your inspections. As I said, it allows you to, to, to identify where your delamination is starting, if it's near surface level or further down. Okay, another instrument that I use regularly is a Schmidt hammer. Okay, what this does, it's got a rebound hammer. You compress it against the floor, you let it out, and then you shoot against the floor. What that does, it gives you a value. And that value, you can, you can cross-reference it to the, the angle at which you impacted your hammer, and that'll tell you how strong your floor is. So when we walk onto sites, and, and it happens weekly, 
I don't want to say daily because that's a little bit too negative, but it happens very often where we walk onto a site, there's a main contractor building a building, they've uh, cast a concrete floor, they've come a week or two later, put a topping on top of it, and the topping is incredibly, incredibly weak. Uh, what that basically does, once I've walked the floor and I've tapped it, um, if I find areas that are concerning to me, what that does, it basically, it, it reinforces my, uh, what's the right word, my assumption that uh, the floors are poor. If you look at this next slide, and I'm just going to go over to this before I speak about that moisture meter. So there you can see, this is a floor that I've walked onto to do an inspection. And um, I took my rod, I tapped it on the surface. And another way of that rod telling you what you're dealing with is if that rod falls flat on the deck and it doesn't bounce, it tells you you've got a problem. If it bounces, generally that's a good sign because then you've got a bit of strength in your, in your concrete or your topping. But in this instance, it basically fell through and um, I walked along the floor, tapped it, and I just carried on. So we rejected this floor, and it often leads to fights with the main contractor and the client. But as I always say, you know, I'd rather have that awkward conversation up front than once your finish has been applied. Because you can't go back and fix it. You know, it's too late to go back and fix it. Okay, another thing when you're walking onto a site... Um, you know, you need to understand what you're dealing with. If it's an existing floor, it might have had a different finish on it before. You need to understand what you're dealing with. This slide basically depicts a, an existing floor that used to have vinyl tiles bonded to it. And that black stuff there is a bitumen. So that's a contaminated surface, really. Um, ideally, you don't want to go over that with a slurry or a, a some form of unguaranteed bonding agent because... No one's going to stand surety for it. Maybe the contractor might, but at the end of the day, um, the contractor's only good for, you know, what he's, what he's, uh, what he's putting down. Um, in, this, in this instance, what we did, and having access to various primers and slurries in our, in our arsenal, we've actually got a primer designed to go over bitumen, not bitumen adhesive, okay? It's important you understand that. It's designed to go over residual bitumen adhesive, which you cannot get off your substrate. So ideally, you want to make sure your substrate is nice and strong. So you've done your tapping tests. The surface is nice and hard. There's no cracks or crumbliness. Um, scrape off your excess bitumen, and we put a modified slurry over this bitumen primer. Proceeded to level the floor with a self-leveling screed, and then we put vinyl on top of that. Uh, no problem. So very important to just understand exactly what you're dealing with. And this is what we try and, you know, we speak to contractors quite often as well. And, um, you know, it's difficult for everyone to understand everything about flooring. No one does. But the more knowledge you can impart and the more you can assist people, the better the result at the end of the day. And that's all we really want to do. We are out there to sell product, to make a living, but also we are out there to, to make a name for ourselves and not to uh, sell the, uh, the end user or consumer short. Okay. So, before, this is another scenario, typically a wood-floated floor. Uh, before you put your primers and your self-levelings on the floor, and again, vinyl, I speak largely towards vinyl in this presentation because we sell a lot of, we sell a lot of screed into the, the medical facilities, into hospitals where they apply sheet vinyl. We sell a lot of screeds into the residential and commercial environment where they put LVT flooring in. And... Um, Although we sell self-leveling screeds, which are nice and smooth, it's important that the contractor understands what they're dealing with. So they should be putting a straight edge on that floor before they start to ensure that they fill up any low areas first. If you put a self-leveling screed onto a floor, the self-leveling screed, it will smoothen up, but it follows the contour of the floor. So important to, to do your due diligence and that the contractor actually checks and understands uh, whether he's got highs and lows on the floor. Again, in commercial spaces, often the contractors are encouraged to diamond grind floors. And by diamond grinding, what you do, you remove surface latents, you also knock high spots off the floor, and then your valleys, we call them troughs or valleys, that you fill with a rapid setting repair mortar. So that makes up part of your flooring inspection and your preparation uh, requirements. 
Okay, another very important thing when it comes to testing floors, and again, um, it, it applies to a lot of floor finishes, but vinyl is in essence a form of plastic. You know, it's, a, it's bonded to a floor, you know, you get vinyl sheeting, you get LVT planks, but ultimately it's bonded to the floor, and it's like trapping anything that might be underneath the floor, the vinyl will trap underneath it. So if you've got floors that have high moisture levels or where there's no damp proof course underneath the slab, where there's potential moisture, vinyl does not like that. The floor will fail and it will fail probably within the first winter cycle. So it's important to understand what you're dealing with. It's, this is an important tool to have. This is a moisture meter. This is... Uh, this specific moisture meter is what I use. It's called a caisson. Um, it's got about 10 settings on it. This is what the machine looks like. I'll put it on and I'll pass it around. So this has different scales to measure, to measure concrete screeds, wood, um, and hydrate screeds, which are self-leveling cements. And what you have is a table on this, on this, uh, on this presentation slide. And you'll see you've got different moisture levels and different readings. So my, my, my meter would be probably similar to a Romex and Tramex, where I would be looking for a moisture level not exceeding a value of 3% um, by, by, uh, sorry, 3% uh, by volume and not more than 70% relative humidity in, in your concrete or in your screeds. If I have readings that exceed that, so if I'm getting readings of 75, three and a half, four and more, that's a problem, okay? Uh, vinyl supplies uh, will, not, will not guarantee any installation where the moisture is above 3%. 3% is your cutoff because it will fail. I'll pass this around. You guys can have a look at it. That instrument's probably about... 10 to 12,000 rand. So it is pricey, but it isn't out the ballpark. Any contractor that's worth the salt should own one of those machines. You know, we often have these moisture talks and, um, you know, to understand what actually happens with concrete and the curing process, again, it's something you can talk about for a long time, but a lot of water goes into concrete when it's manufactured. A lot of water goes into screeds when it's manufactured. So that water during the curing pr process evaporates out of the out of the concrete but there is always a residual moisture value in your concrete and that's why you have these two two and a half three three four percent because that speaks to the moisture in the slab so we don't want anything where there's more than three percent moisture above volume of that slab in it because that could be a problem now with epoxy floors um, you've got a bit of a you've got a slightly more leeway you can go for four to five percent and that will be absolutely fine. Um, but vinyl, definitely not more than three. As I said, vinyl is a plastic. So once you stick that onto a floor, it seals everything underneath it. Okay, so say we've walked onto a floor, we've done our surface checks, we've taken our moisture meter and we've checked the floor and we're getting elevated moisture readings. What happens then? Um, in our range of products at Tell, we have a moisture barrier that we also sell a lot of. It's an epoxy base. It's 100% solids epoxy. It's applied to a surface that's been suitably prepared. When I say suitably prepared, diamond grounded, ideally. You want to grind the floors to take the surface latents off, expose a bit of the aggregate, and give us a very nice rough surface to bite onto. Remember, if there's water pressure coming from underneath your concrete and hitting your barrier, which in essence looks like an epoxy paint, uh, we want to make sure we've got the, boss, the best possible bond so that that moisture doesn't debond the barrier, okay? What the barrier does, it actually stops moisture coming through it. The moisture will then seek the next easiest path of least resistance. So I've been with Tell for almost seven years and I've put that moisture barrier of ours over floors where I measure there and I do it all the time and why I do that is because the moisture barrier has proven itself um, it's a hundred percent solids epoxy it's not like other barriers on the market that 
are water-based. Okay, we have a water-based barrier as well, which we've, I think we launched it about two or three years ago. And um, it's water-based, it's applied thinner. Being water-based, half of what you put down evaporates. So basically it's a barrier that comes with terms and conditions. Okay, <laughs> that's a simple way of putting it. Um, the 100% the solids moisture barrier of ours, which is the vapor stop, as I said, I go onto floors, 80 to 99% relative humidity, all the time, not one failure in seven years. That's a damn good record. This is a very, very real problem. Um, again, often I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep on referring to the self-leveling screeds because that's, that's what we're here to talk about as well. But often self-leveling screeds are applied with normal white liquid primers, which is fine to help it bite onto normal floors where the moisture is, is below three. But if you've got anything over that, you're gonna, you're gonna have a problem and you need to consider a moisture barrier. You'll notice on this slide, Okay, the, the bags are self-leveling repair material. And then to apply that material, there, there are different tools that you use. So firstly, you need to mix it. These bags are mixed with five liters of water per bag. Uh, you need a nice heavy duty mixer to mix the material with. Um, that is a, that's probably a 1.6 kilowatt mixer. It's got a nice paddle on the end of it to ensure you, you agitate the material nicely. Uh, these products are, they have high flow capabilities, these self-leveling repair or, or self-leveling screed. So you need to mix it with a, a strong high, uh, high shear mixing machine. And then it's mixed for a couple of minutes before being applied to the floor. Uh, there are special tools that are used to apply the product. You'll see over here, this is what we call a gauging rake. Uh, many contractors use that. The gauging rake has teeth um, and those teeth are, are, are cut at predetermined thicknesses. To apply your self-leveling screed, you want to apply it at about four millimeters thick. So ideally, you want to use a 10 millimeter rake to get to that four millimeter film. So the material is applied to the surface on top of your moisture barrier or primer. The gauging rake determines the thickness that you put the material down at. And then you've got a spike roller, which you use to de-aerate the material. When you mix the material up, you use a lot of speed, a lot of shear, a lot of speed to mix it up. Uh, by default, you pull air into the vortex of the material. The spike roller is there to release that air. Also, when you're mixing multiple batches at a time, you know, you're pouring material next to each other on a floor and you're spreading it over a big surface. You tend to get um, areas where the material meets. Those are called undulations. The spike ro roller also helps you get those undulations out of the floor. And then before we move on, you'll see there is, I can't show you on the screen there. Those are called spike shoes. Generally, the guy with the spike roller will have a pair of spike shoes on. Uh, that enables him to walk over the surface and pop any bubbles or, or get to any undulations before the material sets. The screed is taken to a floor. It's poured, it's poured over the floor surface before it's raked out. And then... This is a nice example. This is a skeg applicator. You can actually see, if you look at the slide, you can see that light. Okay, that light at the bottom of the blade. That shows you how flat that edge is. So when you drag the material over anything that might be dipped, you can actually fill those dips with that blade. Much better than the rake. So you can see the kind of finish it gives you. And look at the surface. If you look at the surface, you can actually see how pitted and rough it is. But if you look at the actual vinyl itself, the vinyl is generally about two millimeters thick. If you put that onto a surface like this, what's going to happen after a couple of weeks? A couple of days. Yeah, after a couple of days, your vinyl will mirror this roughness and your floor will not be looking good at all. So what your self-leveling screed does with your, your build-up system, it actually improves the surface profile of your floor as well so that you get a nice finish for your vinyl. Okay, and that's just raking and spike rolling in action. You can see the guy at the back is busy pulling the material out. His uh, colleague is coming over and he's just spike rolling to remove the air. Okay, and this is what your floor would look like the next morning, assuming it's a big floor. 
Um, you can see it's quite light in color. The screen is beige. Um, it starts off browny beige, as you saw in the previous slide, and when it cures, it lightens up. And that's, uh, that gives you an opportunity to do a second survey, level survey, before you uh, put your, your vinyl down. So these, uh, these products are based on rapid set technology. The whole purpose is for you to get onto the floor fairly quickly so you can apply your subsequent, your subsequent products or finishes fairly quickly onto the surface. Okay, that's just an illustration of a, another floor survey being carried out. This is a good contractor. You know, they're doing, doing their due diligence. I've seen uh, project managers and, and consultants on vinyl jobs. When the vinyls, after the vinyl's been installed, they come with a, a ball and they put it on the surface and if that ball rolls, they reject the floor. So the more background work you do, ultimately the better the finish. Okay, if you do find lows, you have an opportunity now to repair it. Uh, what they've done, they've taken some self-leveling material and they've, they've filled in the, the, uh, the low areas. And what they'll do, they'll allow that to dry and then they'll run a grinder over the surface and just polish it up. Okay, then adhesives. Now that we've applied our primer or moisture barrier, we've applied a slurry to bond your, your self-leveling screed to the moisture barrier because the two are natural enemies. So we need to marry the two together with, a, with either an aggregate or a slurry primer. We now come to the adhesive. Now, there are a few different adhesives on the market. It's important to understand what adhesive you are uh, using for, for the final product that you're fitting. Uh, luxury vinyl tiles are very, that, I don't want to say they're sensitive, but uh, within the luxury vinyl tile, you've got plasticizers. And over time and with expansion and contraction, the plasticizers are released out of that vinyl and the vinyl is going to want to move. So what you want in an adhesive is an adhesive with a strong or hard bond line. What that does, it'll support the plank and it'll stop it from uh, contracting. If your vinyl planks contract, uh, it doesn't mean your floor is going to fail. It's just going to not be very aesthetically pleasing. You're going to get little, uh, little joints, expansion joints on the short end of the plank and it's not going to look nice. It's going to hold dirt. So the vinyl adhesive, the luxury vinyl tile adhesive, it's a wet lay and it's got a hard bond line in order to support the actual vinyl plank itself. If you're bonding sheet vinyl like they do in the hospitals, slightly different adhesive. There we want an adhesive with a bit of flex in it because now you're bonding sheets down and those sheets are going to expand and contract slightly so the glue needs to help it do that. Okay, so that's basically the build-up. Uh, we've spoken a bit about the surface prep and inspection, inspection tools, your moisture barrier to control any moisture within the substrate or in the background. We've touched briefly on a primer. I haven't spoken too much about the primer, but uh, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the moisture barrier is generally an epoxy, an epoxy based material. Very smooth, very strong, doesn't like cement. So what we need to do, because our self-leveling screed is cement based, it's a natural enemy, we need to create a mechanical bond to marry the two together. So what we do, we incorporate a coarse aggregate. We apply that onto the moisture barrier, allow that to cure. And then we apply a screed directly over that coarse egg. As I said, a slurry is another option. My personal preference is a coarse egg because it actually, it actually um, bonds, into your, it bonds into your moisture barrier and it anchors. And it's very, very difficult to get it out. You're never going to separate the two easily.